Uh, I have to admit that the bulk of my remarks will be somewhat out of step with the theme of the Economic Outlook Seminar, as I'm going to provide, spend most of my time providing a look back, a look back at the Federal Reserve's decision making over the past few years. But if you bear with me for the next half hour or so, you will end up hearing my views on how the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, can work to reduce the level of uncertainty surrounding future monetary policy making. <laughs> Now, as always, any views that I express here uh, today are my own and not necessarily those of others in the Federal Reserve, including my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee. I'm going to start with some FOMC basics, though, before I, I plunge into the, the bulk of my remarks. The Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is one of 12 uh, regional reserve banks that, along with the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., make up the Federal Reserve System. Our bank represents the ninth of the 12 uh, feds. And by area, our district is the second largest. Our district includes Montana. It includes the Dakotas. It includes Minnesota, northwestern Wisconsin, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Eight times per year, the FOMC meets to set the path of monetary policy over the next six to seven weeks. All 12 presidents of the regional feds uh, including me, and the seven governors of the Federal Reserve, System, the Federal Reserve Board, including Chairman Bernanke, contribute to these deliberations. Now, I said seven governors. Currently, there are only five governors. There are actually two open uh, spots. Now, the committee itself, though, consists only of the governors, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and then a group of four other presidents that rotate annually. And as Bill mentioned, I'm one of those four presidents right now. The other ones are the presidents of Philadelphia, Dallas, and Chicago. Now, I've said that the FOMC meets at least eight times per year. But how do those meetings work? Now, in a typical meeting, there are two so-called go-rounds in which every president and every governor has the opportunity to speak without interruption. The first of these is referred to as the economics go-round. It is uh, kicked off by a presentation on current economic conditions by Federal Reserve staff economists. Then the presidents and the, the uh, governors describe their individual views on current economic conditions and their respective outlooks for future economic conditions. The presidents typically start by providing information on their, uh, about their own district's uh, economic performance. As a president, I get that information from my research staff, but I get that also from interactions with business and community leaders in industries and towns from all across the district. Now, after this first go-around is complete, everyone's talked about the economy, the chairman speaks. And he then, he briefly, first briefly, but thoroughly summarizes the preceding 16 perspectives. And I can assure you this is no easy task. And the chairman's balanced and thoughtful treatment of, of our remarks is one of the many reasons he commands such respect among his colleagues. He then provides his own views on the economy. So that's the first go around, which is all about how the economy about, about the economy. The committee then turns to the second go around, which focuses on policy. And again, the staff begins. The staff begins with a presentation of policy options and their implications. After that, each of the 17 meeting participants has a chance to speak on what each views as the appropriate policy choice. This set of remarks is followed with a summary by the chairman, which he lays out what he perceives as the committee's consensus view for future policy. The voting members of the FOMC then cast their votes uh, on, the, on this policy statement and thereby set monetary policy for the next six to seven weeks. Now, by going through the FOMC meeting in, in, in this kind of detail, I'm hoping I'm able to convey two things. First, meeting participants largely view monetary policy as a technocratic exercise that's fundamentally apolitical. As I mentioned earlier, our policy discussions are largely based on information gathering and model analysis by meeting participants and their staffs. I would say that the tone of the discussion is pretty much in accord with its rather technical substance. There is disagreement, of course. And 
how could there not be disagreement in such challenging and unusual economic times? But as a relative newcomer, two, two years under my belt, I've been impressed with how the dialogue within the meeting is always fundamentally grounded in a deep respect for the job at hand and for each other. The second thing I think you should take away from my description of FOMC meeting is that the structure of the FOMC mirrors the Federalist structure of our government. Representatives from different regions of the country, the various presidents of the, of the regional feds, have input into FOMC deliberations. And as I've described, that input relies critically on information received from district residents. In this way, the Federal Reserve is deliberately designed to give the residents of Main Street a voice in national monetary policy. So that's some FOMC basics to sort of set things off about how monetary policy making works. But now I want to transit to uh, talking about policy objectives, uh, which Bill made, made, made some reference to in his introductory remarks. The FOMC has a dual mandate. And that dual mandate is established by congressional statute it's to set monetary policy so as to promote price stability and maximum employment. The heart of the price stability mandate is the Federal Reserve's inflation objective. And the FOMC communicates its inflation objective to the public in a number of ways. Most prominently, at quarterly intervals, FOMC meeting participants publicly reveal their forecasts for inflation in the longer run, maybe five or six years. And these forecasts are based on the assumption that monetary policy is optimal. And those forecasts usually range between one and a half and two percent per year. They're often collectively referred to by saying the Federal Reserve reviews inflation as being mandate consistent, so consistent with the mandate laid down by Congress, if it is running at 2% or a bit under. So that's a phraseology that's often, often used. So that's the price stability mandate. Now Congress has also mandated that the FOMC set monetary policy so as to promote maximum employment. Now an important and ongoing challenge for the FOMC is that it is much harder to quantify what the maximum employment mandate means. Um, than, than it is a price stability mandate. Changes in minimum wage policy, demography, taxes and regulation, technological productivity, job market efficiency, unemployment insurance benefits, entrepreneurial credit access, and social norms all influence what we think of as being maximum employment. Trying to offset these kinds of changes in the economy with monetary policy can lead to dangerous shifts in inflationary expectations and in inflation itself. So those are the objectives of the, that the committee keeps in mind as it uh, struggles with the decision of how to set monetary policy. Price stability, collect, this collective notion of 2% or a bit under, and then maximum employment, which is changing depending on economic conditions. With that in mind, those, the, the, those objectives in mind, I'm going to look, I want to look back over the past four years in terms of the actions first, talking about the actions the Federal Reserve took, and then talking about the outcomes of those actions. Now, why did I pick four years? Well, the natural, uh, National Bureau of Economic Research has a business cycle dating committee. And the National Bureau of Economic Research sounds like it's a government organization. It's not. It's, just, it's a private sector entity. Um, largely, and the people on the business cycle dating committee are basically academic economists. It serves as the official arbiter of precisely when recessions begin and when they end. And the committee has determined that what is commonly referred to as the Great Recession began in December 2007 and ended in June of 2009. During that time, uh, real gross domestic product, GDP adjusted for inflation, fell by 5% and unemployment nearly doubled. Now, the Federal Reserve responded to the Great Recession and the associated financial crisis in a number of ways, but they can roughly be grouped into two distinct classes. First, the Fed engaged in a vast amount of lending to firms believed to be in sound condition. 
It lent through conventional vehicles like the discount window and through currency swaps with foreign central banks. But it also lent through relatively unconventional vehicles like the term asset-backed securities loan facility. Second, so this one, one response is a bunch of lending that took place. And the second response is the Fed lowered the real interest rate facing borrowers and lenders. Okay, before I go further, let me clarify some terminology. So I just use this term, the real interest rate. What I'm referring to there is the interest rate net of inflation. Thus, if the interest rate on a loan that, you, that, that you've taken out is 5% per year, and the lender expects inflation to be around 2%, then the, what we would call the real interest rate is roughly 3%. And economists typically think it's the real interest rate that matters for the economy and its decision making um, more than the nominal interest rate that you actually see out there in uh, uh, the, 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 the interest rate you observe in the newspaper or, or in, uh, at the bank. Now, early in the recession, the Fed lowered its target for the Fed funds rate. Given that inflation expectations remain stable, this action of lowering the short-term interest rate, the Fed funds rate, served to lower the real interest rate. Because if inflation is staying the same, you lower the, 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 the interest rate you see in the marketplace, that means the real interest rate is falling. By early 2009, when the Fed funds rate could really go no further, as I'll talk about, the Fed used large-scale asset purchases of, um, uh, to achieve further reductions in the real interest rate. So let me first talk about this lending response, and then I'll talk about the interest rate cuts. Now, to understand the, 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 Fed's, uh, the Fed's responses to the events of 2007 to 2009, we have to step back to the second half of 2006. At that time, firms and people around the world held a wide array of financial assets that were ultimately booked, backed by U.S. residential land. So when you hear that a mortgage-backed security, ultimately, at the end of the day, that mortgage-backed security was backed by U.S. residential land. They viewed those assets, those holders of those assets, viewed them as largely being risk-free. They may have understood that a fall in the value of U.S. land would impose large losses on them, but they put low odds on such a, a, a fall taking place. Rather, they seem to believe that U.S. land prices would continue to rise at a steady clip as they had over the preceding 10 years. So from 1996 to 2006, land prices in the U.S. rose uh, very rapidly. By the second half of 2007, that belief began to unravel. The idea that these assets were all risk-free, uh, that belief uh, began to unravel in the face of incoming data. People were learning the hard way that U.S. land was a risky investment. Now the only question was, how risky was it? And that uncertainty about how risky it really was planted the seeds for what became a global financial panic. Now what do I mean by the term financial panic? So here, of course, I'm an economist, um, as, as Bill mentioned. An economist, when they define a term, the way they define it is by offering two new terms, neither of which have a definition. So that's what, how I'm going to proceed. But, so what do I mean by the term financial panic? Financial panics are events that blur the line between what we call liquidity and solvency. Okay, so now I have to tell you what liquidity and solvency are. So a firm is solvent if its revenues in a discounted present value sense exceed its expenditures. A firm is liquid if it is able to raise enough funds, either by borrowing or by selling assets, to pay its current costs. Now, when a financial market is functioning well, solvent firms are typically liquid firms because they're able to borrow against their future profits to be able to pay off any costs they have. What happens in a financial panic, though, is that lenders feel unable to assess future profits and or the collateral of borrowers. Borrowing becomes highly constrained. Credit markets cease to function as well, and even highly solvent firms may become illiquid firms. Now, as I, I, I talked about, many forms of collateral around the world were either implicitly or explicitly backed by one asset, United States residential land. But by mid-2007, as those land prices fell, 
financial markets became increasingly uncertain about how to evaluate mortgage-backed securities and other assets backed by U.S. land. That translated into uncertainty about the ultimate solvency of institutions holding those assets. But that meant people were uncertain about the solvency of those institutions' creditors as well, and those creditors' creditors, and so on. What happened was these spreads in credit markets between treasury returns and other bond returns began to widen, at first slightly, and then alarmingly as the panic conditions took firmer hold. Now there's general agreement about how a central bank should respond to a financial panic, going back almost 200 years now. They should react by communicating that they're willing to lend freely to solvent firms against a wide range of good collateral at some kind of penalty rate. This policy is a good one for a couple of reasons. First, it provides a source of funds to potential borrowers who are illiquid but nonetheless insolvent. Second, it provides a floor to collateral valuation. If private lenders know they can always use collateral seized from a defaulting borrower as a vehicle to borrow money from the central bank, then, uh, then that puts a baseline uh, use in place that serves to spur private lending. So this is the operating principle, which is the lend against freely to solvent firms against a wide range of good collateral at some kind of penalty rate. And at the beginning of mid-2007, the Fed took a number of actions that were consistent with this basic operating principle. It lent money through to financial institutions through the discount window and its close cousin, the uh, term auction facility. It injected liquidity into a broad range of essential credit markets through a veritable alphabet soup of special lending vehicles. In some senses, these interventions were typical for a central bank operating in the context of a financial panic, just going along with this operating principle that I described earlier. But the size of the problem meant that the operations were unprecedented in their scale. At their peak, the interventions made up more than $1 trillion of Federal Reserve assets. Now there is no doubt, I think, that these uh, uh, interventions saved many solvent firms from collapse during the financial crisis. Over time, panic eased, and the spreads in financial markets normalized. Once that happened, once the spreads got back to, to, to normal, the private sector stopped borrowing from the Fed, because it found the Fed's penalty rates too onerous. And as a result, the Fed shut down these lending facilities in 2010, but basically be, they shut them down out of disuse. They were, they, the private sector had stopped using them. It is plausible that the Fed's loans through the various special facilities exposed it, and by extension, the American public, to some risk of loss. But it's difficult to know how much risk was involved. The general way, the general way you try to measure financial assets risk is by looking at the spread between its yield and that of a safe benchmark like treasuries. But in a financial panic, a relatively large fraction of such a spread is not due to risk, it's actually due to illiquidity the fact that you're worried about being able to sell the asset on. And the goal of the central bank's intervention is exactly to get rid of this panic-driven illiquidity. So you can't gauge the Fed's risk exposures without somehow correcting those spreads for that illiquidity factor to get at what's really risk. Doing that division, calculating what's due to risk and what's due to illiquidity is extremely difficult. What we can say with certainty is the Fed didn't lose a penny on any of these transactions. All the loans have been repaid. Now, I want to be careful here to distinguish the lending I've been talking about from the institution-specific assistance that the Federal Reserve provided to firms like AIG, and, um, and, as well as to the purchase of, uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, aid the, the purchase of Bear Stearns in, in March 2008. These institution-specific interventions were deemed necessary by the Fed and by the Bush administration because they believed that there were no adequate procedures in place for liquidating the assets of these systemically important financial institutions in an orderly way. So in 2010, the Dodd-Frank Act was passed and it specifically provides such procedures for the orderly resolution of systemically important financial institutions. At the same time, and, and totally correctly in my view, 
The Dodd-Frank Act removes the Fed's ability to engage in this kind of institution-specific um, assistance that it did in 2008. The Act does leave in place the Fed's ability to engage in the broad-based market interventions of the kind that I've described earlier, albeit um, with more congressional and, and White House oversight. So that was the first response to the, to the events of 2007 and 2009 by the Fed, which is broad-based lending against uh, to, to solvent firms. And now I want to talk about interest rate cuts. And I've talked about how the fall in land prices generate a sharp increase in risk perceptions in financial markets and how that's led to a financial crisis. Now I want to turn to a second key effect of this fall in land prices. The fall reduced the net worth of many households and firms. According to Fed calculations, household net worth fell by over 25% from the second quarter of 2007 to the first quarter of 2009. Households respond to this change in their balance sheets by foregoing consumption, which led in turn to a fall in output and employment and put downward pressure on the price level. So the FOMC reacted, much as central, any central bank would, and many central banks did around the world, by lowering its target interest rate from 5.25% in August 2007 to a range of between 0 and 1.25%, 0.25% in December 2008. And it remains at that low level between zero and a quarter percent um, ever since. Since inflation expectations remain stable, the FOMC's actions had the effect of lowering the real interest rate I described earlier. Households typically respond to lower rates by saving less and demanding more consumption. And firms undertake more investment projects because their opportunity cost of funds is smaller. So in this way, the FOMC sought to and has partially offset the impact of the, on the economy of this loss of net worth associated with the fall in land prices. Now, I think it's safe to say the FOMC would have liked to respond by cutting its target interest rate by even more than it did. But the target, this target interest rate just can't, it cannot go below zero. Zero is the, as we say, the zero is the lower bound. Instead, the FOMC has uh, tried to put downward pressure on interest rates through another method, which is to engage in large-scale purchases of long-term assets either issued or backed by the government. The goal of these transactions is to lower long-term rates and, again, in the same way, offset the impact in the economy of the net worth shock. So to sum up, the fall in land prices triggered an increase in risk perceptions and a decrease in household net worth, the increase in risk led to a major financial crisis that has been cured thanks in part to the actions of the Federal Reserve that I've described, and the decrease in net worth led to a major recession and ongoing slow recovery. The Federal Reserve's reduction in real interest rates has lessened the impact of this change in net worth. So I've talked, I, I've made these claims that the, the, the Fed has, has, has softened the blow of the, of, the, uh, of the fall in net worth. I think it brings up a question of outcomes. I've talked about actions, what the Fed did. How did that translate into outcomes for the economy? In particular, how has the Fed done relative to its dual mandate over the past four years since the onset of the Great Recession at the end of 2007? First, I'll start with price stability. The answer there is remarkably well. The personal consumption expenditure, PCE inflation rate, has averaged 1.8% per year from the fourth quarter of 2007 through the third quarter of 2011. So you go from the, uh, right before the Great Recession through the third quarter of 2011, and rate of price inflation has averaged 1.8% per year. And that's, I would say, the two, that's basically consistent with that 2% or a bit under um, translation of the price stability mandate. Now I want to be clear here by what I mean by inflation. The number I just gave you, 1.8 percent per year for nearly four years, refers to what's termed headline inflation. It includes all goods and services, including food and energy goods. And when the Fed says that it's committed to keeping inflation at 2 percent or a bit less, it means prices for all goods and services including the gas you put in your car, I put in my car, and the food we put in our tables. 
We make reference to year-over-year core inflation, which I, I will do later in my speech. That strips away inflation, strips away food and energy and talks about what's happening to the growth of prices without food and energy goods. The reason we do that is because we think it's a better predictor of what headline inflation is going to be over the next three or four years. I, I want to spend some time explaining why there's no longer an intrinsic connection between the size of the Fed's balance sheet and inflation. And the reason I'm doing that is I, I talked about how the Fed bought uh, uh, assets backed by the government or issued by the government. In fact, they bought a lot. The Fed has bought over $2 trillion of securities issued or backed by the government. And the way it's funded those purchases is by tripling the amount of deposits held by banks of the Fed, so-called bank reserves. Now, the standard reasoning is that this kind of reserve creation is inflationary. Banks are only allowed to offer checkable deposits in a proportion to their reserves. And we think about, economists think about these checkable deposits as basically a form of money. Because like cash, checkable deposits make, deposit, make transactions easier. So in this sense, when the Fed creates bank reserves, and bank reserves are held with the Fed, you can think of them as being like a license, being held by the bank, a license to create money. By giving out more licenses, the FOMC is allowing banks to create more money. And if you took any course in economics at all uh, in school, you learn this. More money chasing the same number of goods, you get inflation. I think I'm pretty safe in saying that in this room, that for four years in, in grad school out of economics, I probably have uttered this phrase, more money chasing the same number of goods creates inflation more often than anyone else in this room. But this connection between bank reserves and inflation is simply not operative right now. Banks have few good lending opportunities, so they're not attract, trying to attract deposits. As a result, they're keeping nearly $1.6 trillion of reserves at the Fed in excess of what they need to back their deposits. In other words, banks have the license to create money, but they're choosing not to do so. Now, that's right now. I'm confident in the future that uh, the economy will improve, and banks will, once again, have good lending opportunities. And some observers are, are concerned that at that point, all these excess reserves, $1.6 trillion of excess reserves, will serve as some kind of kindling for an inflationary conflagration of some kind. And I think this concern would have been a valid one three years ago. But in October 2008, something very fundamental changed in the monetary system in the United States. Congress gave the Federal Reserve the power to pay interest on bank reserves. Right now, that interest rate is a quarter, a quarter of a percentage point, 0.25%. But by raising that rate judiciously, the Fed has the ability to deter banks from using their reserves to create money. And through this mechanism, the Fed can prevent inflation. The Fed's ability to pay interest in reserves means this old and familiar link between increased bank reserves and higher inflation has been broken. Now, of course, this does require the Fed to raise the interest rate on reserves in response to changes in economic conditions. And you might be asking yourself, will the Fed do that? Will the Fed raise rates in a sufficiently timely and effective manner to keep inflation at 2% or a bit less? But that's always the question. It's always the question to ask about Fed policy, even when the Fed has a small balance sheet. And that's my point. Because the Fed can pay interest on reserves, the size of its balance sheet does not, in and of itself, undercut the, credi the credibility of its commitment to keep inflation at 2% or a bit under. And that's why I think survey and market-based uh, measures of expected inflation over the, la uh, uh, um, over the next five to 10 years have remained stable as the Fed expanded its liabilities um, greatly. So that's in the price stability front. Um, the Fed has kept inflation over the past four years uh, at 2% uh, or a bit under, 1.8% in particular. Um, it's expanded its balance sheet greatly, but there's no reason for that expansion of its balance sheet to lead to inflation now or in the future. Now we turn to the employment mandate. Unemployment remains disturbingly high at 
But, and this is important to keep in mind, it would likely be much higher without Federal Reserve interventions. Suppose the Fed had not followed its aggressive lending uh, policies or its imaginative forms of monetary accommodation. What would have happened to the economy? Now, this is a counterfactual. There's no definitive way to give a definitive answer to this question. But we do have the Great Depression to think about. And the evidence from that is, is suggestive. In the early years of the Great Depression, the United States was on the gold standard. And the Fed could not readily adjust the quantity of bank reserves. As a result, the Fed did not engage in broad-based lending during the 29 to 33 period, nor did it cut interest rates aggressively. By 1933, hosts of financial institutions had failed. Real GDP had fallen by over 25%. Unemployment was 25% as well. And the nation had experienced annual double-digit rates of, def of deflation, price falls, at over 10% uh, a year. The Fed's passiveness in 1929 to 33 was associated with an economic catastrophe. So my review of Federal Reserve performance since the beginning of the Great Recession, December 2007, by and law, uh, basically that the assessment is that despite profound economic shocks, the Federal Reserve, led by Chairman Bernanke, has successfully met its price stability mandate through its lending programs and through innovative forms of monetary accommodation. And these actions also help keep the unemployment rate from rising even higher than it has. As part of its accommodative policy, as I've talked about, the FOMC greatly expanded its balance sheet. But this expansion need not trigger inflation now or in the future because of the ability that the Fed now has to pay interest on reserves. OK, so this is an economic outlook seminar. And I've spent most of my speech looking back. Let me close by offering some thoughts about future policy. I've underscored the Federal Reserve's success in meeting its price stability mandate over the past four years. And the Fed's actions have helped keep unemployment from rising higher. But the unemployment rate, currently at 9%, remains disturbingly high. And FOMC meeting participants are projecting that it will fall to only about 8% by the end of 2013, so two years from now. The FOMC does have tools remaining. It could put a further downward pressure on long-term market interest rates in at least a couple of ways. First, it could buy more long-term Treasury securities or securities issued by government-sponsored enterprises like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Second, the committee could extend its prediction for how long it will keep its short-term interest rate exceptionally low. So right now, the committee is uh, projecting that it will keep the short-term, the Fed Fund's target rate um, at, at its current at exceptionally low rates at least until mid-2013. So at least until mid-2013. It could provide more stimulus by extending that, 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 that projection. I think, though, it's important for the FOMC to do more than simply decide at each meeting whether or not to buy more assets or keep interest rates low for longer. Any current decision is based on the FOMC's forecast of the future. And no forecast can be perfect. I think the committee needs to provide a public contingency plan. That is, it's got to provide clear guidance about how it's going to react in a wide variety of economic scenarios. For example, in November, the last, the last meeting, there's in November 2nd, the committee provided projections of what it expects to happen in the next few years. It projected that, in 20, uh, that uh, core inflation will be 1.9% in 2011. That's pretty much baked in the cake because you know, 2011 is almost done. And then it projected it will fall back in 2012 and 2013 to around 1.7%. But suppose core inflation and the outlook for core inflation has risen to 3% by the end of 2013. This is hypothetical, purely hypothetically. Suppose it's risen to 3% by the end of 2013. While unemployment has fallen only to around 8 to 8.5%. A public contingency plan would allow the public to know what the committee is going to do in this eventuality. Now, I think this kind of public contingency planning would have a lot of benefits. I'll mention two. 
So in recent statements and speeches, I've described why the FOMC actions in August and September seemed inconsistent with the evolution of the macroeconomic data in 2011. This kind of inconsistency between data evolution and what the FOMC actually does is just much less likely to occur if you have an explicit public contingency plan in place. Now second, I've heard from businesses that policy uncertainty is curbing their incentives to hire or invest. Similarly, I've heard from consumers that policy uncertainty is curbing their incentive to spend. A public FOMC contingency plan can help reduce the level of policy uncertainty being created by the Fed. Now, it's a contingency plan. No contingency plan can ever be definitive. Inevitably, the FOMC will learn things that it did not expect to learn and events will occur that it did not expect to occur. And so there may be conditions that force the FOMC to deviate from a chosen plan. But having a public plan and couching its decisions against the backdrop of that plan would enhance Federal Reserve transparency, Federal Reserve credibility, Federal Reserve accountability, and Federal Reserve consistency. Thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take your questions.